uh, there was a time when there we had very high poaching rates uh, almost uh, uh, 25 in a year but now we we were fortunate that last year was a zero poaching year and uh, there was no uh, uh, rhino which had been poached Kaziranga National Park, nestled in the northeastern state of Assam, India, is a breathtaking sanctuary renowned for its extraordinary biodiversity. Renowned the world over for its iconic inhabitant, the Indian one-horned rhinoceros, home to the majority of the world's population of this majestic species, the park has become synonymous with rhino conservation. Additionally, Kaziranga is a haven for the Bengal tiger, Asian elephant, wild water buffalo and swamp deer the park's wetlands are teeming with bird life including migratory birds currently the field director of kaziranga national park sonali ghosh was the topper of the indian forest service batch of 2000 2003 she is also the first woman to be appointed as the director of kaziranga park which is over a century old in the past Sonali Ghosh has worked rigorously in systems management as she believes that the forest frontline staff is key to protection and management of protected areas and is also leading efforts in community engagement. Let us hear from Sonali Ghosh on the conservation and livelihood efforts at Kaziranga. Tell us about the unique flora and fauna of Kaziranga National Park. Kaziranga National Park and Tiger Reserve is uh... as we say the one of the most uh, uh, iconic and one of the most uh, charismatic landscape uh, in assam and uh, it is literally like the jewel in the crown for for assam uh, kaziranga uh, the name uh, you know it has several uh, you know uh, mythologies uh, assigned to it and we exactly do not know that how this name came up but uh, the the closest that we know of is that there was a girl called kazi and she used to have her uh, you know livestock graze in this uh, lovely grassland so so that's one uh, story which uh, is very popular that basically it was this girl kazi and her uh, you know grazing areas uh, which became kaziranga and uh, when we say grazing when we say that you know uh, livestock it basically means that we are looking at this fantastic flood plain grassland and which is uh, what we uh, is the core of uh, kaziranga uh, as you all know that we have the river brahmaputra which is the largest uh, river in in india and it kind of uh, bisects the assam state into two and it has this maximum flow uh, in in assam so in kaziranga uh, what we have is the brahmaputra flood plain ecosystem that is uh, kind of you know cushioned between the the uh, in the north by the himalayas and on the south by the uh, the karbi hills and in this beautiful grassland ecosystem uh what we have and what has over the period of last 117 years what has happened is that we have have this model of conservation of the big five so kaziranga model has helped support what we call as the big five uh which you can see at a single place in a single time um, uh in in a landscape which is basically the asian elephant the bengal tiger the greater one horned rhino uh, the swamp deer and the asiatic uh, wild buffalo and uh, in this we are also having the world's largest population of the greater one horned rhino uh, there are uh, records which say and which suggest that the rhino population had dwindled drastically at the beginning of the 19th century there were less than 20 of them uh, which were there for various reasons because there was uh, game hunting there was uh, poaching and uh, you know uh, habitat de- degradation had happened but over the years and since the time from 1905 uh, when there was an intent and declaration that kaziranga should be a protected area 
there has been a series of measures which has helped protect the park. So, as a national park, as a as a as a tiger reserve, Kaziranga has developed this unique model, which is to have invest in forest frontline. So, uh, I recall the time when I was here in two thousand two. They were possibly around uh, seventy to eighty odd parks, uh, anti poaching camps. Now we have a whole set of one hundred and ninety seven. anti poaching camps spread across the uh, the 1300 square kilometers and when i say this anti poaching camps this is a very unique method where in the in the landscape you have one uh, you know a building or a chowki or a camp and this camp is uh, then manned by four to six uh, forest frontline whose single job is to patrol is to you know uh, look at the area around the camp and take care of the big five and the other animals in that area so this model where the uh, the forest front line is able to uh, be vigilant and to be able to be able to uh, you know uh, manage uh, or take care of the population of wild animals from uh, any intruders or poachers or so on has helped increase the population of rhinos uh, there was a time when there we had very high poaching rates uh, almost uh, uh, 25 in a year but now we we were fortunate that last year was a zero poaching year and uh, there was no uh, uh, rhino which had been poached uh, the rhino poaching is primarily uh, for the rhino horn which is uh, considered uh, uh, a commodity mostly in south asia southeast asia and uh, over the years what has happened is that with effective protection and with legislation the the uh, the poaching has uh, gone down and also in terms of the trade uh, which has been controlled uh, the kaziranga model when we say as as i mentioned has this uh, front line it has the surveillance systems in place and at the same time over the years kaziranga has been able to expand its territories because when you have so many wildlife and their increase in um, in their numbers you need additional habitat so over the years we have had 10 additions to the kaziranga national park so now it is not only uh, confined to the south bank of the river the north bank and on the western on the downstream there are uh, protected areas which are now part of the kaziranga tiger reserve kaziranga is renowned for its annual flooding how does it impact the park floods are very important for the uh, the riverine the, the grasslands that are the key of uh, kaziranga you know we may we cannot say that floods are not required because they in a way recharge the numerous water bodies in in the park they in many ways are able to flush out you know the effluents or, or from the areas and take it out into the brahmaputra downstream so floods have been an integral part of the ecosystem because of floods we also have this climax vegetation which is of grasslands because otherwise the woody vegetation would have come in so floods have been important in terms of that what has uh, been uh, uh, kind of detrimental due to climate change is the predictability of these floods uh, the other aspect has been that since we have the increase in the animal population and they do this annual migration from the uh, from kaziranga to outside the landscape so now there is a need to strengthen the uh, the fringe uh, landscape we have to uh, gain more areas and and also look at the surrounding areas to give them a safe passage especially during the flood season how has kaziranga provided livelihood opportunities to the communities living around the park kaziranga is the jewel in the crown for assam and uh, if you talk to any common person any you know somebody they will have a sense of pride when they talk about kaziranga and this is not just because you know we have uh, this uh, you know the big five and the other you know key biodiversity in this area but it is also because this has been a source of livelihood for 
several you know um, uh, uh, lakhs of people who are benefiting from this area it could be uh, tourism for sure because that's uh, the main livelihood that we are looking at but other than that if you look at in terms of let's say uh, the the you know kaziranga is a repository of fish stock in in this landscape and these fish stock is the reason why in several of the community in the fringe areas uh, after the rainy season is over the fishes are being uh, able to you know uh, uh, take uh, uh, populate their wetlands and and uh, you know uh, the the fish stock has been uh, is sustainable in these landscapes other than that we also have uh, you know people who are practicing um, uh, cultivation or for that matter you know people who are into handlooms and textiles as you are aware that as sam we have a very strong uh, woman led uh, you know cultural initiative where every household if you see uh, an assamese woman they will have a handloom uh, you know loom with where they can uh, you know weave their um, gamusas as we call it or other textiles so this uh, is again inspired or in a sense also linked to the uh, to the kaziranga landscape so when tourists come to kaziranga i feel that uh, we must appreciate and we want to popularize this this time is that from the 429 odd square kilometers of kaziranga it has now expanded to almost 1300 square kilometers and kaziranga is not just the core where we are talking about the big five it has dolphins it has hula gibbons it has cat langur it has numerous birds it has you know cultural uh, landscapes it has uh, the river uh, you know uh, landscape which all have their own unique flavor what have been the steps taken to reduce human animal conflict human animal conflict or human elephant conflict is is there omnipresent in our uh, areas because you know that's the nature of the animal as well you know uh, elephants are long distance travelers they cannot be in a particular place for a uh, for a long time so they have to migrate over landscapes uh, so this existence of people and uh, uh, you know animals is something which is which is which is always there especially in assam but it is even more needed but at the same time we have an increase in our human population so uh, of course the government per se has these excretia schemes so there they are able to you know support with compensation if there is a loss of life or if there is damage to crop so we do have a very robust system most of the states have it and we are able to immediately compensate the people but other than that we also have as i was mentioning that you know we work with ngos we work with people and technology to come up with some sort of a mitigation measures so solar fencing or for that matter you know uh, uh, alternative crops and not have paddy but have lemon crops or you know anything else which the you know the animals may not like to feed on so those are some of the things which have helped uh, in terms of uh, mitigating the conflict how does kaziranga engage the community as stakeholders so people living among uh, um, uh, you know in the communities uh, we have to involve them that's how the the government policy is and in case of tiger reserves in in case of uh, protected areas the the mechanism the statutory mechanism is under eco development committees the same aspect uh, when it is in reserve forest becomes joint forest management committees so uh, in case of kaziranga also we have eco development committees that are that we work with and we are able to you know um, uh, take up some uh, activities like alternative livelihood support eco tourism uh, and so on depending upon what they want and that is again something which we do through a a robust participatory process using participatory rural appraisal techniques and we are able to do that so that takes care of the community the you know the fringe and others other than that in terms of involving the youth and the children and others we need to you know do awareness activities we need to take up outreach activities in kaziranga uh, the waterfowl census the migratory waterfowl census is a fair, is a big hit 
because a lot of people from outside are also able to you know contribute as volunteers and they help in the annual bird count so these are some of the ways in which we involve them how does kaziranga engage civil society organizations and ngos in its work we must uh, work with uh, with communities we must work with civil societies we must work with uh, youth and and academic institutions because that's how we are able to you know get the sense of uh, kaziranga in its whole uh, in its essence and uh, so for example uh, i can give you simple examples let's say about uh, you know i was in a village uh, uh, recently and they the people had this issue with uh, human uh, with elephant uh, movement and they said that the elephants you know tend to come and they raid crops now they had a simple request they are not they are not saying that we don't want the elephants but they are saying that we want a solar fence now that solar fence is something that either we could provide from as park management or i could connect to an ngo which has the mandate to do this to provide for the village community so that is a small uh, sort of collaborations we do there could also be the the key uh, support that we get from ngos is is in our capacity building and training because we need to constantly you know uh, train our or kind of you know upskill the trainings for our local communities for our for, forest front line and and in all this the ngos come forward to help us other than that the civil society the the college you know i was so happy to see that in in bokaghat which is the office of kaziranga headquarters there is a science college which is there which is exclusively uh, you know taking up students to study science and so that kind of closer uh, collaborations is what we need so that we can you know uh, spread the word for uh, for the kind of work that is being done what has been your experience of working at kaziranga park i started my career i was very fortunate that uh, you know i got the opportunity to uh, uh, serve uh, as on my, in my probationary days in 2002 uh, here in kaziranga and uh, the change that i see and thankfully you know the change that i see is uh, not inside the landscape you know the inside the the park in 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 terms of the grasslands in terms of you know it's probably this the same we have an increase in the animal populations and so on but it doesn't seem it is still the same and of course fortunately we have acquired several new areas the change has been outside in terms of growing population in terms of you know the the resorts which have come in uh, which are uh, quite a few compared to what they were 20 years ago so those changes are uh, something which are clearly visible other than that i think uh, in terms of the use of technology in a good sense uh, the use of you know better communication systems uh, having more equipment having more people frontline has been some of the good changes for the park management